Okay. Any thoughts on that? How does this concept relate to the church? Is it obvious? You know, normally in a team, everybody knows their position. You know, if it's if it's a basketball team, everybody knows. I mean, either you're one of the guards, one of the forwards, or the center. Or baseball team, and you can go through all the positions. Every position is different. You need to know the plays. Now, it says when we become a Christian, you know what, we're, what, what happens? We are baptized. This is what it says in Corinthians, into the body of Christ. All of a sudden, you're, you're in the church, whether you like it or not. And everybody has a gift in the church. And it says that God has given us gifts to profit the body. There are no personal gifts that you have for yourself. All the gifts are outward focused. Maybe you don't know what your position is, what your place is in the body, where you belong, who you are, what your gifts are. Maybe you have not experienced significant healing. You've got different things, limitations that you think are holding you back. Everybody <clears throat> is important. Right. I remember Bessie. Bless her heart. She could barely walk. At the end, all she could do is just be in a wheelchair. She was a necessary part of the body. If you knew her, She was an integral part. I have limitations too. So do you. We have to get beyond ourselves. Amen. Everyone is a minister. Why? This is all out of 2 Corinthians 5. Because we're accountable. Jesus says, what? Too much is given, much is required. How many, Robin, you said this this last week, something to the effect that if I know something, then I'm accountable to it. And sometimes I think, then you said, sometimes it's best, best, best not to know something. <laughs> if you know Jesus, if you know that he saves, if you know that his, he's the one that transforms, we are responsible and accountable to God for what we know, and we're going to have to answer to that someday. Knowing the fear of the Lord, that's why we urgently, with everyone we meet, to get them ready to face God. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5 11. Knowing that we're accountable to God, knowing that we, and everybody has to face God, and we have to face God because we are accountable to much is given, much is required. Did you know that you're going to be accountable? Did you fulfill the very purpose that I set you on this earth to do? That's what we have to answer to God for. Why are we ministers? Because we're loved. For the love of Christ controls and compels us. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ puts us into action. We are ruled by Christ's love. The love of Christ puts us into action. Because of that love, that awesome love that Jesus poured into us, we want to talk to others. We want to help others. We want to get involved. We want to get out of ourself. It compels us. That's what Paul says. Why are we ministers? Because we are convinced. That's what it says right here in 2 Corinthians 5. We are convinced that, all, that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all. That those who live should, be no longer, should no longer live for themselves but for those who died for them and was raised up again. If you are absolutely convinced that Jesus is the answer, that he died, that he rose again, that he saved you, if you are absolutely convinced, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you be a light to the world? Well, I don't know. If 
you're convinced, okay, let's say you're going down the highway, and all of a sudden, there's a bridge that went out, and there's other people coming along that highway, what are you going to do? Just turn around and just say, ah, let them go also. You're absolutely convinced that if people go that direction, they're going to die. If you're absolutely convinced that Jesus is the only way and everybody else, if people don't follow the way of Jesus, they're bound for eternal damnation. What are you going right. to do if you're convinced? Right. But if we're not convinced. Ron, what if you're wrong? I've heard that one before. What if you're wrong, Ron? What if this Jesus that you're talking about, what if you're wrong? How about this other one? What if you're wrong? What if I'm right? But if you even question that, then you haven't had that personal encounter with him. Then you don't know. You don't know. You don't know that he's the best one. Because, eh, you know, I live with it without it. Because we see with new eyes. That's why we minister to people, because we see with new eyes. Because all that... God has done. We now have a new perspective. We used to show regard for people based on worldly standards and interests no longer. That's the voice. And here in the CEV it says, we do not judge people by what they seem to be because we have new eyes. Right. And so when people start acting in certain ways, we, we look at them differently. They're a jerk. What's wrong with them? How can I help them? <clears throat> There must be things in their life that are way spinning out of control. How can I be a light to them, life to them? Because we're ambassadors. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us what? What did he give us? The ministry of reconciliation. Look at your neighbor and say, you have a ministry. He has given us this ministry. And what's reconciliation mean? Let's say if, if Benita and I are fighting and we reconcile, what does reconcile mean? We've made up. We, we're, we're friends again. The walls of animosity and the walls that divide us are been removed and we can connect now. This ministry of reconciliation is the walls between people and God have been torn down. Right. The walls that we have with one another have been torn down through Christ. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation. The gospel is all about relationships, right? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ without counting that sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We have the message of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore what? Ambassador. Christ. You're an ambassador. What's an ambassador for a country do? They represent. You know, like, like here in the States, we have an ambassador from China. Represents the people of China to the people. Of, we represent God to people. You're an ambassador. You're an ambassador, Chris. Ambassador Chris, how you doing? <laughs> we're ambassadors. What if we what if we knew that we were an ambassador for heaven? Would we act differently? And lastly, we're grateful. This is right out of 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. Don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. Some translations say, don't take this grace for granted. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Let's make a clean break from everything that defiles or distracts us, both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit. You know why? Because you're a holy temple for the worship of God. Because we're grateful. We do this out of worship for God. That's what this is. I don't want you to go witnessing. Or go. I want you just to be it.
be who Jesus has called you to be. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. Okay, last question. A little small groups. Jen's happy today. <laughs> Where are you in, this, in the growth process? Spiritual baby, spiritual child, spiritual adolescent, spiritual father and mother. And what hinders your spiritual growth? Like, let's say, if you're a child, how do you become adolescent? How do you adolescent? How do you become a father? What's, what's preventing you from growing? And what helps you grow spiritually? All right, let's just talk about this.